Good morning, everyone. I'm Ibrahim Abhishek from the Water Channel. Welcome to the webinar. We are lucky to have with us today Dr. Sergio Salinas, uh, who will be discussing with us how to turn water into wine. Uh, sorry, I meant to say how to turn uh, seawater into fresh water or desalination. But if you think about desalination, it is a potentially miraculous process, at least to a layman it appears like that. Uh, to a layman like me, it seems that if we are able to perfect the process of desalination, at least theoretically, it will solve all the water scarcity problem of the world. And uh, it appears to the layman that if we can uh, tap into, if we can do the, this, we can uh, tap into the vast oceans to satisfy our freshwater needs. So the question that comes to mind is, what keeps us from doing that? Is it the technology? Is it the cost? Or is it something else? Uh, these are some questions that I have uh, personally and I'm sure a lot of us have um, and we hope that some of these questions will be uh, answered at this webinar today and uh, Sergio is the right person to be leading the discussion today because he's a widely recognized expert in this topic. Uh, he has a PhD in desalination and water treatment from uh, Technical University Delft and he has a master's in water supply engineering from UNESCO IHE. Uh, he has worked as an expert consultant and as a teacher or lecturer in desalination uh, in several countries in uh, Latin America, Europe and the MENA region. Before I hand over the proceedings to Sergio, I would just like to request you to please put your questions and comments into this chat box here, which you have already located, I see, uh, from the introductions that have been coming in. And we will keep collecting them throughout the webinar, and we will discuss each one during the Q&A session, which will be after the presentation. So please keep them coming, your questions and, and, and comments, uh, and please keep this webinar interactive. With that, Sergio, I would like to hand over the stage to you. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you very much, Abraham. Well, it is for me a pleasure, an honor to be here in front of my computer and through the internet being in front of your computers, wherever you are in the world. So this is an introduction to desalination and membrane technology. My name is Sergio Salinas. I work at IHE since 2011 in the field of desalination and membrane technology, and I'm part of the group of water supply engineering. Um, I hope that by the end of this webinar, you will be um, interested in the field, and perhaps we can get in contact uh, to collaborate together. Let's start with a question if there is a need for desalination. As we know, or we may know, uh, there is plenty of fresh water on the Earth. However, for making use of this fresh water on the Earth, there are some limitations, starting with the rainfall is not evenly divided. The top right figure, it's a world map in which we are observing the regions in when there is a lot of rainwater or not. Another limitation is that population is not evenly divided. We have areas that are densely populated in brown in the middle figure, or areas which are scarcely populated. More and more, we are talking about mega cities as a, an urban problem. And another consideration is that the water use is not evenly divided. As we are observing in the figure on the bottom right, the use we have of water is very different from depending on the country we are from. In many countries we use water for agriculture, for industry, um, municipal use, etc., etc. I have to use the click, I forgot. So, Many countries are running out of water, and many more will run out of water. Why is this happening? Because we are abstracting more than available renewable resources. And this has happened already for many years. In the future, this is going to get worse because uh, of population growth. Um, last year, the World Population Prospects report estimated by then, then by 2050, the world population will increase to 9.7 billion. In addition, uh, the economies are influencing the water use we have. So the, the, more, uh, the better we have uh, our income, the more water use we may use of it. So as a result of this uh, uh, exaggerated attraction of renewable resources, we come across to what is the water stress all over the world. And we are looking at here at uh, 
map from water stress from the Water Resources Institute, highlighting the areas in the world where water stress is high in colors red or reddish. There are some areas already in the world in which there is arid uh, uh, land or low water use. Those are the gray areas. It is expected, well, yesterday I came across to a Twitter from the United uh, Nations uh, World Water Assessment Report, in which they mentioned that by 2050, 40% of the population is expected to live under severe water stress, including almost the entire population of the Middle East and South Asia, plus significant parts of China and North Africa, which is a worrying fact. And this is going to happen because of population growth, urbanization, climate change. How can we solve these local water stresses? Well, we can start by saving water, by increasing the productivity in agriculture and industry, reducing leakages in public water supply, and by applying progressive tariffs in the distribution of water. We can also transport uh, water uh, large distances, and I think there are many countries with examples of this, of several uh, hundreds of kilometers of transport from one basin to a region where there is not so much water. Another alternative is storing, uh, for instance, uh, the overflow in rainy season in aquifers. So this is uh, possible, but not everywhere it's, uh, uh, it's feasible. It depends very much on the geology and the soil uh, aquifers. And then, of course, we have water reuse. And we should increase water use uh, for industry or domestic wastewater uh, in agriculture, for instance. And finally, we have desalination as an alternative to alleviate these local water stresses. And desalination not only of seawater, but also of brackish water, which is present in the, in the groundwater, and also of wastewater. So to the question, can desalination alleviate water scarcity in developing countries? We believe that seawater is considered to be a drops-proof water source, as it does not depend on river flows, rain water, rainfall, reservoir levels, or even climate change. So it's a kind of infinite resource. And we believe that desalination may be an option to alleviate the scarcity perhaps with priority in industry, and of course, in coastal cities. Let's talk about now what are the desalination technologies or the main desalination technologies that are applied uh, in the world. There are basically three main groups, starting with distillation processes, then we have membrane processes, and then ion exchange. In the case of distillation processes, we can have two types of thermal technologies, starting with multi-stage flash evaporation and multi-effect evaporation. These thermal processes require a form of energy in the form of steam and also electrical energy. When we talk about membrane processes, we can differentiate reverse osmosis membranes, nanofiltration membranes, electrodialysis or electrodeionization, which demand of a form of energy in terms of electricity. And we have ion exchange, which is mainly used for polishing water, for instance, for municipal and industrial use. And we have resins that are in charge of cationic and anionic uh, removal of ions. The form of energy in this case, we have chemicals for regeneration. What are the applications of these technologies? If we are thinking about seawater, we have basically two options, either distillation, a thermal process, or we have a, mem mem a membrane-based process, which is reverse osmosis. If we have brackish water or even fresh water, we can apply uh, mainly reverse osmosis, 
and electrodialysis. If we are interested, for instance, in polishing, in further removal and for further decreasing the concentration of ions in the water, we can use ion exchange. And if we have, for instance, uh, surface water, groundwater, that is hard with, ha with a high concentration of calcium carbonate, for instance, and with high concentration of organic matter, non-concentration could be perhaps the most appropriate solution. The normal operation range of these desalination technologies is observed in this figure. In the horizontal axis, we have the total dissolved solids from 100 milligrams per liter up to 100,000 milligrams per liter. And we can start here from the bottom right to the top, in which we see that distillation can be applied for waters starting from 25,000 milligrams per liter up to 100,000. Ion exchange, as we mentioned, can be used for polishing, uh, further removal of ions in the water, concentrations less than 500 milligrams per liter, electrodialysis between 400 and 3,000 milligrams per liter, so fresh water and slightly brackish water. In the case of uh, brackish water, we can use reverse osmosis membranes that are specific for seawater or specific for brackish water. The salinity of seawater is not constant all over the world. Actually, it, it, uh, it has a wide range. The average salinity in the world is about 35,000 milligrams of salt per liter. Nevertheless, we can observe regions, especially in the Middle East, where the salinity of the seawater can increase up to 45,000 milligrams per liter. In the figure on the left, we can see the map of ocean salinity. And we can see here that the salinity of seawater depends on the location. It depends on the um, water bodies that are the, uh, discharging in the sea, in the amount of uh, freshwater rain, uh, rainfall, etc. One of the uh, oldest technologies for uh, desalination of seawater is distillation. And perhaps a, um, yeah, it's the oldest technology available for seawater desalination, uh, mainly used for, uh, uh, by the sailors when they have to travel uh, many miles uh, deep into the sea. And in this process, uh, the dissolved salts remain uh, behind as fresh water, and vapor is, uh, as energy is uh, boiled away, and then we have a condensation with heat loss via air or water cooling to produce uh, pure water. So in this case, we have three products. We have the feed water, we have the distilled water, and of course, we have a highly concentrated also solution, which is the brine that can be discharged perhaps back into the sea. Uh, nowadays, we have uh, no sufficient processes, uh, learning from the experiences in the past. And this is called a multi-effect distillation processes, in which we have, for instance, starting from the left to the right, we will have a seawater feed that is introduced into the first effect. Into the first effect, we have a steam that is coming from a boiler that is going to be in charge of increasing the temperature of the seawater that is uh, being uh, fed to this uh, first effect. The seawater is going to uh, be produced, uh, is going to be evaporated, and this uh, vapor is going to be passed into a second next effect, the second effect. And we can see here also that the brine of the first effect, which is uh, with high temperature, is going to pass to the second effect. And we are making use of the, of the temperature of the seawater in the first effect. We are going to make use of the vapor that was uh, produced in the first effect to generate a second time or a second batch of vapor or a second uh, in the second effect, and so on. So we will also have here a, a condensation happening uh, in each effect. 
In the case of the first effect, the condensate is returned to the boiler watt, to the boiler site. In the second effect, the, constant, the condensation will be produced as fresh water product into this manifold, which is going to collect the, the condensed fresh water of all the effects that could be present in this multi-effect distillation unit. In practice, we could have up to seven, eight effects to make use of this uh, uh, residual heat of, of previous effects. Another technology that is available for desalination and perhaps is the dominant in the market is reverse osmosis. In this uh, process, the, we make use of membranes that have very small pores that could have basically two configurations, as flat sheets or as capillaries. In reverse osmosis, the water is forced to flow through the pores of the membranes with the help of high pressure. So we need uh, uh, a lot of energy, and we will discuss about this later. And we, unite, we apply this high pressure to, over, to overcome the salinity of the water. So this is overcoming the osmotic pressure of the water, and also to overcome the hydraulic resistance of the membrane itself. And eventually, the pressure required to overcome the fouling development on the membranes. In these reverse osmosis membranes, salts cannot pass the small pores. So they are rejected. In practice, we are talking about 99.7, 99.8 rejection of salts uh, present in the water. In this table, we can see a comparative uh, um, removal by different technologies, depending if we are talking about inorganic compounds, organic microorganisms, or suspended ion colloidal matter. So for instance, reverse osmosis is a technology that is able to remove monovalent ions, divalent ions, organic compounds, microorganisms, suspended colloidal matter. Nanofiltration is also very effective for divalent ions, organic compounds, microorganisms, suspended matter, but not so much for monovalent ions. So it's very specific, for instance, for removal of hardness in water, removal of color. Ultrafiltration, microfiltration, they are membrane processes, demand low pressure, and they are specific for removal of microorganisms and suspended, suspended and colloidal matter. And electrodialysis, very specific, very efficient in the removal of uh, ions present in the water. Nowadays, more and more, besides quantity uh, for, produ for the production of water, we are talking about removal of a specific micropollutants. And in this case, reverse osmosis has proven to be a very uh, robust technology, not only for producing water in quantity, but also in the very high quality product water. Briefly and um, uh, grossly, we can talk about the component in a seawater desalination plant. And we will have from left to right the ocean, the seawater uh, source, we will have an intake that is going to uh, be the first step to bring the water to the pretreatment. Uh, there is a, a lot of discussion about what is the best type of pretreatment um, for different conditions uh, and different uh, locations in the world. We can talk about uh, media filtration versus membrane technology, and more and more uh, in case of algal bloom events, the introduction of dissolved air flotation as a strategy to cope with uh, difficult waters. After pretreatment, which is in charge of guaranteeing a certain quality uh, specific for the reverse osmosis membranes, we will have a high pressure pump operating at pressures from 50 up to 90 bars in charge of uh, forcing, the, forcing the water pass through the reverse osmosis membranes. In the reverse osmosis, we will have on the left side the feed water, 
on the right side, the fresh water, and here at the bottom, the concentrated stream for the brine discharge. We will talk about this later when we talk about environmental concerns. The fresh water quality after reverse osmosis membrane is aggressive in nature. So we need to remineralize. We need to bring back minerals. So let's remember these reverse osmosis membranes have decreased the salinity content by up to 99.7%. So the fresh water, the product, product water, needs to be post-treated. And here we are going to correct the pH, and we are going to bring back minerals like, like calcium, like magnesium, uh, to improve the hardness, uh, the buffer capacity of the water, before it can be transported into uh, the distribution or uh, later consumption in our houses. Um, an example here uh, of one, uh, one of the famous plants in the United Arab Emirates, uh, Fujairah 2, is a combined power plant with a total production of energy of about 2,000 megawatts. And it makes use of two of both technologies, a multi-effect distillation with a capacity of 460,000 cubic meters per day, and the reverse osmosis capacity of about 136,000 cubic meters per day. In, in this plant, uh, we have a, a, a steam that is going to be produced in the power plant and is going to be used by the multi-effect distillation. And uh, we can see in the photo here that uh, the large area actually is mostly used for the multi-effect distillation in comparison in the bottom left with the reverse osmosis membranes that are much more compact in, in, in the land use that they required. Um, another example uh, is a plant located in Ashkelon in Israel. It was uh, commissioned in 2005 and at the time was the largest seawater reverse osmosis plant in the world with a capacity of 330,000 cubic meters per day. It has been expanded to about 400,000 cubic meters per day. And the type, the type of contract for this plant was a built on operate transferred uh, um, type, which is, is still applied. The footprint of this plant is about 70,000 square meters of an area of about 350 meters times 200 meters. <clears throat> and the third part of my presentation is about the desalination trend worldwide. And uh, uh, actually, there is a database, uh, a company in the UK called uh, Global Water Intelligent, and they compile every year a report uh, about the desalination uh, industry. In 2020, they reported about 25,000 desalination plants all over the world in over 180 countries with a capacity over 100 million cubic meters per day. If we talk about drinking water production with reverse osmosis, uh, we are talking about 24, 24 million cubic meters per day produced from seawater, from brackish water about 9 million cubic meters per day, and about 3 million cubic meters per day produced from fresh water. This is an equivalent to serving over 330 million persons in the world that can drink water supplied by desalination plants at a rate of 120 liters per person per day, which perhaps is not significant, but is growing more and more uh, uh, per year. This uh, world map is illustrating the world desalination capacity for the three main uh, sources that are seawater in blue color, brackish water in brown color, and wastewater or wastewater reuse 
in green color. And we can see here that the region that mostly demands desalination is in the Middle East, with a capacity of about 47 million cubic meters per day. Then we have uh, North America, with United States basically uh, desalinating brackish water with a capacity of 10 million cubic meters per day. And we have other regions like Latin America with a capacity of about 4.2 million cubic meters per day, uh, the Caribbean 1.5 cubic meters per day, mainly seawater. In Europe, we may use uh, about 65% from seawater desalination. North Africa, Middle East, the regions that mostly demand the application and use of desalination. Sub-Saharan Africa, about 2 million cubic meters per day, also mainly seawater desalination. And in Asia, we have more a combination of the three water sources. Seawater is present, but there are, they are also making use of uh, wastewater for wastewater reuse. And a very good example of that is Singapore, with a total capacity of about 2.1 million cubic meters per day of desalination, of which 55% is seawater desalination, 43% is wastewater desalination. In the case of Australia, about 3 million cubic meters per day, 60% desalination of seawater, 22% wastewater reuse, 15% brackish water. Uh, Japan is one of the countries that is also rapidly growing in their economy and in their use of uh, desalination. And in this case, they mainly use desalination for industry, not so much for municipal or agriculture. And uh, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, they, 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 uh, these islands or these countries make use also of desalination will equal with equal parts of seawater, brackish water, and wastewater uh, Reuse. Um, the highest capacity desalination countries in the world are presented in the table on the right. Saudi Arabia is the number one country, about 19 million cubic meters per day, followed by the United States, uh, the Arab Emirates, China, Spain, Kuwait, India, etc. Other countries that are relevant or that are not in the Middle East are, for instance, Mexico is growing. In their next five years, they are planning to implement five desalination plants in the northern uh, area of the country. Indonesia is uh, also depending, uh, Japan, Brazil. Chile is also investing a lot on desalination for industry, for the copper industry. And uh, in the figure on the left, we can see here the uses that these countries are making use. In light blue color, we have for drinking water, light blue or dark blue color for industry. And we can see in green color, some countries, not all of them, make use of desalination for irrigation. Like, for instance, Spain, Kuwait, Morocco, etc. So the main application is either production of drinking water or the use of uh, desalination for industry. The total desalination capacity is over 100,000 cubic meters per day. Um, Suez this year projected, they expect that by 2030, the capacity all over the world is going to reach about 200 million cubic meters per day at an estimated growth rate of 6% per year for mainly use in the municipal and industry. Two-thirds of the capacity is depending on membrane-based desalination, and one-third is depending on thermal processes, like multi-stage flash distillation or multi-effect distillation. Reverse osmosis is dominating the market because the investment costs and energy costs are lower than for distillation. Seventy percent of the desalination is happening in the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, in the other regions of the world, uh, they are growing more and more because of water stress, drought, climate change as uh, catalyzers of uh, and, uh, alternative sources for, for, for alleviating scarcity. Sixty percent of the desalination uh, depends on seawater. Eight percent depends on wastewater. 
20% of the world depends on brackish water, and more on, uh, but also fresh water and pure water can be further treated uh, with desalination, for instance, for industry uh, applications. The trend uh, in desalination plants over time is that they are growing in size. In this figure, we can see here the reverse osmosis plant capacity versus uh, the time uh, history. In, we can see here that the capacity is increasing over time. This is becoming uh, relevant and critical because uh, for these desalination processes, pretreatment plays a very important role. And pretreatment is going to influence how uh, frequent the reverse osmosis membranes, for instance, need to be cleaned. And this is um, critical when you have thousands of elements that need to be put on, on hold for the um, stopping the production because of cleaning, with high risk of damaging them in the process. OK, let's uh, start and talk about, about the energy consumption in these desalination processes. Um, in this table, we can see uh, different technologies that are applied in the production of drinking water. In the second column, we, tank, we can talk about the pressure that they apply in the process. The third column, the energy demand per produced cubic meter in kilowatts hour. And in the case of thermal processes, the heat that they demand in the process. In the case of conventional drinking water, they demand very low uh, energy consumption, 0.1 to 0.2. If we talk about uh, membrane filtration with ultra or micro filtration, the pressure range between 0.5 to 2 bars with a comparable uh, energy consumption. Nano filtration with the smaller pores, they demand a higher pressure to push the water through the membranes with a slightly higher energy demand, 0.3 to 0.5 kilowatts hour per cubic meter. And then we have brackish water reverse osmosis in which we, the pressure can be actually from 5 up to 20 bars with an energy consumption in the range 0.5 to 1 bar to 1 kilowatt hour per cubic meter. And in the case of seawater desalination with reverse osmosis, the pressure range that is applied is between 50 to 90 bars with an average energy consumption nowadays between 3 to 4 kilowatts hour per cubic meter. In the case of distillation, we need uh, both uh, uh, electrical energy and heat. In distillation, the consumption of energy will range between 1 to 4 kilowatts hour per cubic meter, but we also uh, need heat. The cost of energy, it depends on um, where you are. It depends on uh, yeah, um, perhaps incentives that you have for industry, um, typically in the range 0.05 to 0.1 dollars per kilowatt hour, and in the case of heat, 5 to 15 dollars per gigajoule. About cost, um, we have here in the first column technologies versus the cost in euros per cubic meter. So in the case of seawater reverse osmosis desalination, the production cost is between 0.5 to one dollar, one euro per cubic meter. Brackish water, the costs are lower, 0 0.25 up to 0 0.5. Electrodialysis comparable to brackish water, nanofiltration is slightly lower, and ultrafiltration, microfiltration, 0 0.05, 0 0.1 dollars per cubic meter. But ultra microfiltration do not remove salts, they will only remove microorganisms, suspended colloidal matter, in comparison with seawater reverse osmosis. Energy is a major cost component in seawater reverse osmosis. Now, let's put in context a reverse, the cost of producing a one cubic meter of drinking water from the sea. For instance, when we go to our kiosk, 
and to, we buy a bottle of water or a bottle of Coca-Cola, we can pay in the Netherlands from one euro up to perhaps three euros, which is just one liter or even half a liter. Nowadays, uh, of course, uh, large scale uh, desalination plants have lower costs, but still the production of 1,000 liters of drinking water from the sea is less than one dollar, less than one euro. But still, there is potential to optimize the energy consumption in this desalination process, and, the, and in this way also reducing the cost of uh, production. Um, this is a uh, representation of the consumption of energy in a seawater reverse osmosis process. And for instance, if the production cost is one dollar, about 40 cents of the production come from the amortization, so the payment to the bank of the loan or the construction of the plant. Another 40 cents will be spent in the energy consumption. And about 20 remaining cents will be used for uh, the staff working in the plant, the consumption of chemicals, replacing the membranes in the plant, the cleaning of the reverse osmosis membranes, and maintenance. So energy plays a major role in the cost of desalination processes. Um, here we can see an example of a seawater reverse osmosis plant located in Perth. It's called the Southern Seawater Desalination Plant with an average consumption of 3.6 kilowatts hour per cubic meter. This plant uh, uh, receives the supply of energy from a wind farm and also from a solar farm. About 55 megawatts are produced with a wind farm and about 10 megawatts are produced by a solar farm close by in the region. This is a, a photo of the solar plant located in the region of Perth. It's called the Mumbida Wind Farm. And they have 22 um, uh, wind uh, towers, producing each about 2.5 megawatts uh, generated by these windmills. And uh, of course, the windmills, the solar panels, do not produce energy the 24 hours of the day but they can be used to offset the energy consumption or the energy take from, from, from the grid uh, by the reverse osmosis plant. The use of solar parks is growing more and more all over the world. One of the first ones was in uh, Gujarat, in India, and is the Charanka Solar Park with a uh, making use of uh, photovoltaic cells. In the table on the right, we can see, uh, well, I just took it from Wikipedia, but in the last two years, there has been a very large investment development on the implementation of solar parks for energy production all over the world. Not all these examples in this table are the, going to supply desalination plants, but uh, more and more, uh, I think, uh, the industry is focusing on the need and the use of sol or renewable energies for desalination. A very, uh, perhaps, simple example of the potential of solar photovoltaic uh, energy for decentralized desalination processes and we can see here a photo of a photovoltaic cell at the roof of a house in the Netherlands. There are many solar panels here. In this house, uh, as an example, they generated 3,700 kilowatts hour over a period of one year. This amount of energy is equivalent to the energy needed for desalting about 1,000 cubic meters. This considering and the total energy produced divided by the average consumption 
to desalinate seawater. The yearly consumption of drinking water from the tap in this house equals about 120 cubic meters. So, of course, there is an investment cost, but the application of uh, renewable energies can be uh, applied at different uh, scales, from large desalination plants to also uh, uh, decentralized uh, systems. Now, briefly, uh, some of the environmental concerns that are uh, in, uh, related to desalination. Um, so desalination, uh, I quote um, a definition from a paper from 2008 that says desalination is a water treatment method that is often chemically, energetically, and operationally intensive, focused on large systems, and thus requires considerable infusion of capital, engineering expertise, and infrastructure. So, what are the main environmental concerns in desalination? There are many, actually, starting with the concentrate discharge, marine pollution, uh, the influence of seawater intakes in marine life, the use of chemicals in the treatment of, uh, of drinking water, the disposal of materials in desalination plants, land use, the impact on climate change to the energy use and the greenhouse gases emissions. Um, so there are many concerns, but there are also many sustainable solutions that are technically feasible. If we talk about the greenhouses, we can minimize and compensate the energy use. If we talk about the, the concentrate disposals, we can uh, minimize the impact through uh, dispersing concentrate through multiple diffusers in a suitable marine site. We can treat all the backwashing and cleaning waste to reduce the marine production. We can use a surface of submerged intakes with low intake velocities. We can implement low we can minimize the consumption of chemicals, or we can just avoid the use of chemicals in the treatment of seawater. We can improve the recyclability and the reuse of the, of the materials. And we can also minimize the land use and landscape to a specific site location, and perhaps by making use of technologies that are also compact in their, um, in their engineering. Finally, um, I'd like to present to you what IHE Delft is working on and is uh, busy in the field of desalination. We do research in desalination and membrane technology, mainly in reverse osmosis uh, systems, and we are focusing on the problem-focused, solution-oriented, demand-driven research questions with the interest to translate practical problems into research uh, projects. And uh, we work with water quality methods and tools to quantify the fouling potential of water to optimize pretreatment efficiency. We uh, work with the modeling of fouling and scaling. Uh, we are interested in the removal of micropollutants, uh, personal care products, medicines that are present uh, in water, uh, assessment of pretreatment and also dealing with post-treatment uh, for the reverse osmosis uh, permits, working also on the development of life cycle assessment, environmental impact assessment, or concentrate disposal, etc. Um, our institute, IHE Delft, has three main pillars, working on desalination, on education, institutional strengthening, and also research and innovation. And we are also busy in these three pillars in the group of desalination. We have a PhD program that uh, is specialized in the, the field of desalination and membrane technology. Our Master of Science on Water Supply Engineering has a specific module on desalination. And we are also contributing to the graduate professional diploma program on water supply engineering and wastewater treatment technology. 
Um, this year, we will start our online course on desalination and membrane technology. It's a, um, this presentation, perhaps, is an introduction to what is coming ahead, to the basic principles, application, design uh, of this type of systems. We offer tailor-made training. So uh, wherever you are, if you're working in, in the water sector and you're interested in having a training uh, for your colleagues, for your company, uh, we are available. So please contact us. Um, all our research is also uh, open access. And um, so everybody can benefit from that. We are interested in strategic partnerships with governments, with universities, research centers, water utilities. So the aim is that our research should have an impact, should be problem driven, um, with the aiming at reducing the impact on the environment, promoting circularity, etc. So concluding, um, Desalination by itself cannot deliver the promise of an improved water supply unless underlying weaknesses are addressed, like the reduction of non-revenue water, appropriate cost recovery, environmental impact assessment before implemented these kind of processes, and the need for uh, expertise on these technologies for a sustainable implementation of them. And it's very important to have an integrated water resources management involving all the water cycle. With that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. And I'll be happy to contribute with some answers to the many questions you may have. And if not possible during this webinar, please reach out to me through this email. And please visit our website, www.un-ihe.org for uh, information of all our educational capacity building offer in all the water uh, cycle. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sergio, for your uh, great presentation. We have, uh, we have to take a lot of questions, so let's start. Uh, first of all, WikiF asks if uh, microplastics are a concern in reverse osmosis of seawater. Um, I think microplastics are a concern more and more in all water bodies. Not so much a concern in the uh, production of drinking water, because uh, results, at least in the Netherlands, have demonstrated that uh, water treatment is able to remove microplastics. But uh, you all are aware, I think, of the uh, plastic pollution in the oceans, which is a big deal of a problem. Um, uh, in this regard, let's say, uh, we should be uh, concerned with the uh, pollution of our water sources, like seawater. But um, I think in the drinking water production process, we will be able to deal with the removal of these microplastics if they are present uh, in the seawater. But I think it's an issue for all of us. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Sudeep Pal, who asks, how frequently uh, reverse osmosis needs replacement? RO is only option, is RO the only option, or do you believe there are alternatives? Uh, that's an interesting question. Thank you very much. In practice, uh, it is uh, said that the replacement rate of reverse osmosis membranes is about 20% per year. So let's say in about five years, you will replace uh, the, all your membranes in the plant. Nevertheless, this is just an indication. There are plants that uh, uh, have a lifetime of the membranes up to eight years, even cases of 10 years. What influences? Uh, it will depend very much on the type of intake. It will depend very much on the type of pretreatment you have in your system. And in this way, you will influence uh, the frequency of cleaning of your membranes, which will relate to the lifetime of them. Um, as we have seen, at the moment, the two main technologies for desalination are reverse osmosis and also thermal processes like multi-effect distillation or multi-stage flash distillation. Um, 
more and more, as uh, you might recall the, the figure with the growth over time, uh, reverse osmosis is dominating the market because of the investment costs and the lower energy consumption. There is, a lot of, there is more potential of making use of renewable, your, renewable energy sources that will uh, further decrease the cost in the process. And uh, reverse osmosis has also the advantage that has a high productivity in comparison with other uh, membrane processes that have niche application areas like um, forward osmosis, uh, microbial desalination cells, uh, and other configurations of reverse osmosis like pressure retarded osmosis, batch reverse osmosis. So there is a lot of research going, but uh, in practice, we have these two main technologies. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next question is from Jean Lindsay, who asks if continuous drinking of fresh water produced from desalination represents a health threat in the long run. Um, let's uh, talk about two things. First one, we don't drink directly the water that is produced by reverse osmosis. There is the need for post-treatment. And in this post-treatment, we correct uh, for the aggressivity of the water. So we bring back some hardness, and we also bring back some minerals that are essential, like calcium and magnesium. Um, and as a last uh, stage before distribution, we will also disinfect the water, so it's uh, free of any microorganism that could be a, a pathogenic uh, uh, in nature. So. In the long term, um, I don't think it's going to be a threat. There are many reports on this. The water quality um, um, will satisfy WHO considerations before the, it's used for, drink, for, for, for drinking purposes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, next, I would like to put up uh, two questions together. I just read them quickly and I reckon they were kind of related. Let's see. Uh, first question is, would there be a table comparing capital costs, O&M costs per cubic meter treated of existing treatment plants? Uh, how does this affect water tariffs? Any comp And the second question is, any comparison of production costs between usual water treatment plants and desalination plants? So I guess the two questions are related. How, do, how does the cost compare to like uh, uh, existing uh, sort of uh, regular treatment plants and uh, and uh, what kind of effects uh, does it have on water tariffs? Um, I think the first uh, question was answered in, in two of the slides that I, I presented. So uh, desalination is of course uh, demanding a higher energy consumption in comparison with fresh water or conventional drinking water production. Uh, the average consumption is 3 to 4 kilowatt hour per cubic meter, while in conventional drinking water will be 0 0.1, 0 0.2 kilowatt hour per cubic meter. Um, and the second part of the question was, uh, could you repeat, uh, uh, Abraham, please? Yeah, uh, how does this affect water tariffs? Oh, yes. Uh, in order to achieve the lower costs that are reported in desalination plants, less than 1 euro per cubic meter, I think the record is about 50 cents cubic me uh, dollars per cubic meter. Uh, it depends very much on the cost engineering that you have in your plant. Because the cost of energy may not be the same in, in night time that, for instance, in daytime. So depending where you are, uh, for instance, you will want to produce most of the water uh, during the uh, night time than during the daytime. So, um, the energy uh, policies, uh, depend per country, depend per supply, etc. This will also influence the final cost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been getting a lot of questions on costs, and that seems to be a central concern, a central point of curiosity for a lot of uh, the audience members, uh, including the next question, which is from Bijimol Jose, who asks, uh, what is the cost-effect ratio of desalination the saline water, I suppose, is being used for irrigation. I don't think that there is a, um, 
most of the uh, cost in a desalination process comes from the, from, from the energy component, as you may recall. So 40% comes from the payment, the amortization cost. 40% comes from the energy cost. And the rest is um, staff, consumption of chemical, replacements, etc. So this energy consumption is not going to change if you are producing water for municipal use or if you are going to use it for agriculture. Uh, perhaps the difference is going to be uh, you don't need to disinfect the water for, for irrigation and uh, perhaps the requirements for post-treatment are not going to be the same as for municipal use. Um, I don't think the cost difference is going to be significant. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is from Fazul Rizka, um, who asks, what is the best desalination technology for a small community, let's say 100 people in coastal areas? To, um, is reverse osmosis uh, the one? There are many examples, there are many companies uh, from many countries that uh, deliver solutions to this kind of problems. Um, there are decentralized reverse osmosis systems that are making use of uh, solar energy and also windmills, wind energy, to produce uh, the energy for the reverse osmosis desalination. Uh, the challenge in these situations is the storage of the energy for application or for continuous uh, production of uh, desalination, but also uh, the, the frequent start and stop of these kind of systems. That's a, that's a challenge. In the Netherlands, there's a company called uh, Elemental Water Makers. It's also based in Delft. And they produce uh, this kind of solutions. I've seen in their website in, in, in many presentations that they have examples for islands and in the Caribbean or in, in the Pacific uh, Ocean, etc. So there are examples. Uh, sorry. The, uh, I thought the next three questions were kind of similar, so I grouped them together, and they concerned sourcing the energy that is needed for desalination from alternative sources. So the first question is, do you see the energy from waves a possibility? Uh, the second question is, uh, can we use thermal power plant steam to use in, in distillation technology to vaporize? And the third is, if brine can be utilized in, in uh, the production of energy to offset uh, uh, the energy requirements for reverse osmosis. I think the answer to those questions is yes. Uh, um, more and more, there is a, well, we are trying to be creative with uh, making use of uh, the renewable energy sources that we have at hand. Um, it much depends on the efficiency of the processes for them to be attractive. And it depends on the scale of the project. But uh, yes, we can generate uh, energy from, from, from the wave movement. I think there are some examples, but I don't know if there are desalination plants that are making use of this kind of energy source. Um, in the Netherlands, there is an example of mixing two streams with different salinity content to also generate uh, electricity. And um, the second question is, uh, yeah, I think that is the basis or why distillation plants are located next to power plants, basically to take advantage of the steam or the heat that, they are that these power plants are producing. And uh, the third one, uh, can the brand be utilized? For instance, there is a process called forward osmosis, um, the opposite to reverse osmosis. In this case, we use the driving force, a high concentrated stream to desalinate the water. And uh, brand could be used, but I think uh, there are other, what they call draw solutions that could be more efficient than brands. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is, uh from Rafa, who asks, what do you think about uh, eutectic freeze crystallization methods? Oh, that's a very uh, difficult question to Rafi. Rafi is our student at IHE. Okay. And um, in, for desalination, um, it cannot compete in scale 
for instance, with reverse osmosis or thermal processes, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an option mainly used for industry. Um, also, a company based uh, in the Netherlands, in Delft, I, I start up of the TU Delft, uh, has, a, uh, has this product as commercial product. I think it's an interesting solution. Um, I don't know much about it, more than I have already mentioned, but um, I would say it cannot compete with reverse osmosis or, or thermal processes. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next question is from Sava Group Lebanon, who asks, what kind of contaminants are not allowed during the desalination process as mentioned, that is while using heat and while using RO technology? In the case of thermal processes, scaling is one of the main limitations. So there is a lot of um, consumption of anti-scalants to prevent the scaling of uh, sparing soluble compounds like calcium car carbonate in the process that will decrease the efficiency in the process. So we need to control uh, the scaling potential of the water. In the case of uh, uh, reverse osmosis desalination, um, we want to remove, of course, the salt to make it potable. But seawater also contains uh, microorganisms, it contains algae, it contains clay particles, it contains uh, exopolymer particles, substances, etc., that uh, will influence the, the lifetime, the performance of the reverse osmosis system. So for this, pretreatment is very relevant. And it's very relevant not only because of the quality we need to produce in front of reverse osmosis, but also the quantity that uh, needs to treat. Reverse osmosis systems operate at about 40 to 50 percent what we call recovery or conversion. So this means that 100 percent feed water is going to be is going to produce only 50 percent product water and 50 percent will be about the brine or concentrated stream. But the pretreatment needs to treat the 100 percent that the reverse osmosis is going to treat. So it's, it's a lot of it's, it's a high volume of water that needs to be treated. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is from Victoria, who asks, "What happened to the brine? What happens to the brine produced during the desalination? Knowing that, depending from the source of water, uh, the brine might be be polluting." I, I think you addressed that in uh, some of your slides, but uh, would you like to add something to what you've already discussed? Sure. Th this is a very, perhaps, a, a important concern when we think about desalination. And uh, perhaps two points related to that. One is the, the visual pollution, uh, mainly because the brines will have a higher concentration than the water that we are discharging back. But uh, let's analyze. We are, talking, we are taking seawater from the sea, and then we are bringing back the same feed water with more salt concentration back into the sea. In the process of desalination, the only thing that is changing is uh, perhaps the addition of some chemicals, like for coagulation process. We are talking about only salts like iron chloride, aluminum sulfate, or some additives that are polyalkylates to improve the, the coagulation flocculation process. Uh, but these are compounds that are not uh, um, foreigners to, to, to water itself. And we can minimize the, 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 the environmental pollution by having diffusers that are strategically located with rapid diffusion, etc. There are sustainable alternatives to control this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the next question, which is also a, which will have to be our last question because uh, we have uh, gone over time, uh, is from Bishwadu Mohapatra who asks whether any study has been conducted to assess the impact of reject brine disposal from desalination plants, which is mostly directly disposed into surface impoundments, uh, its impact on groundwater quality. Uh, if there have been any studies on the impact of uh, disposed brine on groundwater quality. Um, I'm sure that, that there are studies. I'm positive that there is scientific literature that is dealing with these specific issues. 
it doesn't come to my mind in this in this precise moment. Sorry for that. Okay, no problems. Uh, thank you, Sergio. Uh, thanks a lot for sharing your work with us and for sharing your insights on this very important topic and uh, a very popular topic, it seems. Uh, for me personally, a very valuable takeaway was that uh, desalination capacity and access to desalination countries a varies. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, desalination technology uh, varies a lot from country to country, and uh, so I mean we should not look at it as a silver bullet, as we say, uh, towards in the fight to reduce uh, 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 water scarcity globally, and. Uh, uh, so yeah, for me that was like a very important takeaway and with this we would like to uh, close the webinar. Uh, thank you again Sergio for your great presentation and thanks to the audience for turning up and for your great questions and comments. As I have mentioned before, a recording of uh, the webinar will be available shortly later today in a few hours time on www.thewaterchannel.tv slash webinars. Uh, that is the page that you will be redirected to when we close the webinar. And uh, a small announcement, I would like to pre-announce the next webinar. It will be on September 8th. At the webinar, Mr. Benson Karimba from Kenya will discuss the possibilities of smallholder irrigation using sand river aquifers in semi-arid lands. So I guess we'll be discussing technologies like sand dams and such. Uh, we'll be posting details uh, of that very soon on uh, the Water Channel. So uh, thanks again and see you the next time. Thank you.